Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapists Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, Sue Marriott. Hey, Ann Kelly. Last two episodes, I have to say, episode 96, 97, those are my jam. You like that, huh? Yes. You're interviewing Dr. Patricia Crittenden. I mean... We've read her work. We've been inspired by her work to actually get to really listen to her and just hearing her thought process and going through all the details. I really kind of geeked out, though I could imagine it might have been just a little overwhelming for some individuals that this stuff may not be as familiar to. Yeah, no, I think you're right. She was really delightful. This episode is going to stand by itself. So if you haven't heard those two, don't worry about it. But what we're talking about and kind of like a little giddy about is being able to get Patricia Crittenden on. She is one of the mothers, basically, of the field. Just very briefly, you know, it's Bowlby Ainsworth, and then Ainsworth had a student, Mary Main, and she also had a student named Patricia Crittenden. And there's a lot of similarity between the two theories and the way that they interpret this data, but there's also some significant differences. And just to jump in one sec, the theories you're talking about is attachment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is. This is what we usually hear about with the ABCD model, which is the normal quadrants that you hear. Yeah, that's where you are used to hearing about the quadrants of security in infants, avoidant attachment, preoccupied attachment, disorganized attachment. That's right. So that's kind of main and Solomon at all. It's been super research. It's such beautiful, rich data. There's no questioning this data by bringing in credit in. That still is incredible. By bringing in credit in, she's bringing in her assessment, which is a DMM, which is the dynamic maturational model. But most importantly for us, this is what we're going to do today, is bring it out of the research and into real life and how you can use this in your sessions and how you can use this in reflection upon yourself or your family as well. And that's also something that Credit In is very, very interested in. Yeah. And I love what you're saying that this is just a really deepening. And what I really love about her work is how she brings it into the everyday. When you think about attachment, we often think about it in infancy, and then we think about it in adulthood. Right. How it manifests in adult relationships. Which are two separate bodies of work, really. Right. And we've done a lot of talking about that. Think about the title, the, the dynamic maturation model. That's a pretty intimidating title. And as we listen to her, it all of a sudden makes so much more sense because she's talking about the developmental process that happens in attachment, talking from preschool to childhood and on up. Including sexuality, bringing sexuality into the realm of attachment and culture, looking at larger cultures. Right. And really seeing attachment, I think one of the things she emphasizes differently than more traditional models is not the emphasis on security. She emphasizes that attachment is about the dyadic relationship in danger, in dealing with danger and taking in information from the environment and from infancy, from taking it in from the parent, taking in various forms of information about danger and then knowing how to shift behavior in order to reduce danger and increase protection. And increasing protection is by keeping somebody then close and connected that could provide protection. Available, right? Keeping them actually available. Maine talks a little bit more about closeness, proximity, and safety. And when I say Maine, I mean what Crittenden refers to as the American researchers. This is what we traditionally have heard. It's not only Mary Maine. It's just that we want to honor Mary Maine. So one of the big differences is her research goes all the way through the lifespan, including sexuality, adult relationships. That's part of why it's called the maturational model. That's the M. And the dynamic has to do with exactly, again, what you're saying is that in this early foundation, it has to do with what sorts of information is encoded. And that goes back to some of the biology that Bulby was interested in. But by information, what is she referring to? 
she talks about the information that all the resources that we have as an infant that we come into the world, the resources of our somatic, our body, what does our body feel? What does our stomach feel? And then how one processes that information in a cognitive capability. And then we also talk about emotions, you know, related to our bodies. There's different information processing systems. They're linked, but they're not hierarchical necessarily. What I mean by that, this is funny because it gets so technical and it's so easy to say something a little bit wrong. But what I mean is you can learn from your body, the somatic, as Anne said, you can learn from the emotions coming in and the feelings that you're having. And then you can learn through your thinking. And her argument is really cool because what she talks about is that security looks like you've integrated those three models, that you've integrated all your information systems. That's what basically the B babies are, or in our model, the green, being in the green. Now, on our model, as you go out a little bit on the spectrum, or in her model, it's a circle, which is also really cool, then you begin to inhibit information. So you're going to hear us talk about that. And we've talked about it in different ways. But for example, based on the response of your environment or the response of your caregiver, you may inhibit your feelings because you see that that pushes the caregiver away. Again, this isn't conscious. This is very early, first two years or neuroception. This fits very well with polyvagal theory. You know, on an unconscious level, that if you were to cry and go directly at them because of their information system and how they've been encoded, the caregiver, the caregiver, you're not going to get access to that caregiver. So you begin to learn to inhibit affect and even potentially inhibit somatic information. So you don't even know that you feel bad. And instead, your cognition is online. And on the other side, of course, is that if feelings and expression of affect brings your caregiver closer, then that's going to be a line that gets really developed. And when you're not needing something, you know, when you're in a calm state, you might lose contact with your caregiver. These are just two examples where you would develop in the direction of the information that you take in that's kind of in line with what the caregiver is able to provide and the information that you inhibit. That's a great example. And I think what I really love about how she approaches that is it's so functional. It's not dysfunction. No, no, right. this is adaptive. It's like the infant learns the best strategies that they can learn to deal with danger. And so it's very, very functional. And the best strategy with that particular parent and that particular family, she talked in that culture. And even in that culture from a historical manifestation, we were talking about the caregiver responding, but that caregiver could respond to the emotional expression of the child because of her or his own history. That's a dangerous thing. Right. History even from generations before. Absolutely. Or culturally. Mm -hmm. And one of her points is that when it becomes more problematic is when the infant is the one having to do that adaptation in order to gain access. And with security, the parent is the one that is finding the infant. And because the parent has access to all his or her information, like memory systems, information processing systems, they don't require the child to inhibit one thing or another or to exaggerate. Sometimes what we learn to do is exaggerate something in order to get our needs met. But just like you, she destigmatizes it. I think the neuro stuff in general is pretty destigmatizing, but this is moving it into the clinical realm. It's not just destigmatizing. We're admiring how people have survived and that symptoms are solutions. Right. And if you happen to have a caregiver who has been able to integrate and kind of feel the information is more true, the crying is actually the child's somatic distress that can be cared for. And it's not a form of danger. Then what gets imprinted in that infant is the ability to listen to the body in a more accurate level and respond to the environment in a more in tuned because they're in tuned with we talk again about infancy, but how that translates because the infant brain does really simple relationship pairings. But as we grow up, it becomes more and more complex, right? By the way, I loved her foster care story. Yes. <laughs> what we're talking about is being aware that each one of us, and does, I do, every one of you listening probably has some bias of information that we are more comfortable with or more familiar with. 
And that's good. And so it points to treatment. So if we can begin to, let's say we're sitting with a client for just a second, and this will be familiar for many of you, but that they're leaning in the direction of their mind and order and reason, then it points to these different informational systems that we need to get them integrated with, i.e. their body and affect and emotion. That's a great way to put it because there's the three. If you see them overemphasizing the cognition, they may have had to inhibit the somatic or inhibit their affective emotional states. And so often we see that as somebody being stubborn or cut off or, or it, aloof it, or cool. Right. And, and it's so easy to attribute that as sort of a conscious being a jerk. <laughs> I'm not saying that blue people are jerk, believe me. Right, but it's really easy to misinterpret, especially you mentioned clients, but in relationships, when somebody goes to the cognition and sort of shutting down of the other states, it's really easy then to then elevate because you see it as intentional. And critidin really has a way of helping us integrate the information processing and to go, wait, these things literally... As stress goes up, this person all the way through life has learned to inhibit. And that's a really protective strategy at points and times, maybe not in your relationship now, but they inhibit. And sometimes they even then, depending on how deep that goes, could they could really not just inhibit, but completely omit negative affect. And her point about that as it goes to more extreme is that the body would be really overwhelmed to be accessing that if it wasn't helping to create safety in one's environment. So they might even omit feelings. So when somebody is saying they don't feel anything and we get upset, we think they're holding back, they really may not have access to that. Exactly. And that's part of why it's so threatening. Right. So we keep giving this example of omitting the body and omitting affect, which is fine right now. But when the infant responds in that way, this was a sort of new thinking a little bit to me. I've always thought of that as maintaining closeness with the caregiver, right? Mm -hmm. So I can kind of back into them and look like I'm fine and be playing with my toys and kind of slide backwards and lean against them or be a little more near them. And that's going to get me closer. However, now I'm thinking of it based on Crittenden's work, that it's not just that, that that is also true, but it's also avoiding the disorganization that the child would feel. Because if the child was aware of the bind that they were in, that they're actually needing something and can't go towards them, then it leads to this high dysregulation and disorganization. So part of the distortion of information has to do with keeping ourselves out of disorganization. Does that make sense? So. Yeah. And she talks about it distorting it. It's not just inhibiting it. It's distorting it. So like we said, exaggerating or de-emphasizing or losing contact with. This is where danger and stuff comes in, is that it's also just to keep ourselves sane. It's basically to keep ourselves intact. It's not just for availability of the caregivers, one would say, I guess, is that it's availability of ourselves. It's what part of ourselves can be available. I really like that thought because it's so compassionate for all of us that have suffered neglect or abuse or trauma. And that really emphasizes what we were just speaking about, about the unconscious part of it and that it goes into our body system because it almost does sound intentional. I want to be close to the caregiver, but it doesn't go down on the body as a conscious awareness. It doesn't like, oh, I'm thinking I need to get close, so I'm going to do this. It's I need to keep my body safe and calm. And so that makes a lot of sense. She also talks about false positive affect. Oh, that was really interesting. Just so intuitively true. The example was the mother smiling and the smile's just not quite right. <laughs> and so there's a lot of other information that's conveyed in that smile. Well, thinking of a, of a mother smiling because she's actually really angry, but doesn't really feel like she can express anger. And so there's this false smile that the, the baby or the child as they grow up interpret. And so what do you do with that? Because our bodies have been born believing a smile was supposed to be a sense of warmth and safety. But through neuroception, you're picking up that smile and knowing, oh my God, when my mom smiles like that, that really means she's pissed. Well, you know that, again, if you're a little more integrated too, right? But in order to maintain connection with the caregiver, perhaps that you have to adopt that kind of defense. And right. so then what we see, and she's written quite a bit about this, actually, that the most maltreated children can really have this problem with false positive affect. And it's very dangerous because they're not signaling distress in the world. Basically, her point was that if you know a child's been abused, but they're skipping down the hall and they're smiling big, to really pay attention because where is the aggression? Where is the grief? Where is the sadness? 
And you can see that they're really not aware of it. They're not being fake. When we say false, they're not being fake when they're skipping down the hall. They have really disconnected from the affect. That's right. So either while you're relating to yourself or while you're relating to your client, you're looking like not to miss. So if you have a very compliant client, be suspicious, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you notice that you're very comfortable with anger, then you're going to look for what's split off, which is going to be something more vulnerable, something softer, your neediness. Ooh, I'm going to make everybody cringe. Your helplessness, <laughs> your dependency. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, all those words that just, mm, we can just love it, right? I know people are like going, no, God, please no. Not the V word, not vulnerability. The talk about the split off was really, the way she conceptualized, I thought she did a great job. And so I love what you're saying, like with the split off of the aggression when she's talking about, and we're talking about clients, but we're also talking about your own children, talking about yourself, talking about relationships. What part of you or the people you love did we have to split off? What kind of information did we have to shut down or cut off from ourselves in order to keep ourselves out of danger? And you know, when she was talking about the, like the aggressive bully being more on what we would call the red side, the aggressive bully in childhood. I thought that was a really interesting discussion that people see the aggressive bully only as behavioral, acting out. And if you go just towards the aggression and why are you angry and why are you aggressive, you might be really missing that underneath the split off part is that child's fear. Yeah, I think that's really great. And, you know, we keep using color and she uses a circle. In case you guys haven't, in the two previous episodes, and again, that's episode 96 and 97, you would go to therapistuncensored.com backslash episodes, you can find them. There's a whole slide deck that make this, I think, come alive. Another difference that I want to hit before we end is that the original research that we heard were, like we've said, are in categories. She works in dimensions. We take this as support for our spectrum, for sure. But the dimensions have to do with that the more these things have to be distorted or omitted or exaggerated, the more severe things get. That That's where pathology comes in. And that you can have very healthy functioning people that are what we would say is like lavender, you know, or pink or what have you. But in other words, there's all these subtypes. And so even in her DMM, there are subtypes that have a ton of health. But somebody might be just a bit reserved or a bit aloof or just a little bit in their head, but that doesn't make it pathological. It's only when we've had to distort in these more extreme ways. And that's where the dimensions come in. And that's just part of why it's more helpful clinically. It's really important in that context to think about the cultural impact of what is present for any individual at any one time. You know, we can think of maybe going around and inhibiting certain affects or somatic experiences, but when your environment is incredibly dangerous and it's dangerous for you to be in touch with that, you know, a lot of the work is done on attachment has been done in really safe environments. Or safer environments. Safer environments. Right. Credit and did work with more disturbed kids, maltreated kids, and also a little older kids. A lot of her research is on older kids, which brings up a really great point that a couple of listeners have pointed out. I won't say their names, but you'll know who you are. NP is one of them. <laughs> I just want to protect people's privacy. But this is from our Facebook page. This is from our Facebook page, which please join in. There's a private Facebook page that can help discuss things like this. So this is where we're getting this question. But several people commented on this. Thank you. But this listener felt like it sounded like she worked with more actively maltreated clients or in war and things like that, but that most of us work with clients who actually are very, very, very safe. And we're safe, relatively speaking, in the world. But we don't necessarily feel safe. And they made the point that part of what we're not feeling safe about is our parents' unsafety and maybe even their parents' unsafety. But to speak a little bit about, you know, when we're working with danger, but that danger is potentially intergenerational or even just like it's hard to point to. Right. So it's not obviously present because people come in and talk about their history and say, you know, my mom, my dad, this. So it doesn't really make sense. But if you look at your mom or your dad's history, what may make sense is what was encoded in their body. And what was encoded in their body is what got translated through your infancy. Right. That's where neuroception, right. that's where epigenetics come in. But right. this, this can still be actually really valuable because right. we don't want to see danger as saber toothed tigers or, you know, the cumulative trauma, for example, over generations. 
Now, let's bring it right back to this world. How is that dangerous for a child that has just been born? Remember that there's so much happening, like our brains are exploding and we're all fear, basically. We're all amygdala when we're born and we're learning very quickly to adapt to our environment. And so even very subtle changes, it's that idea of our first experience of ourselves as our parents' unconscious. I know I've said that before, but it's so terrifying. <laughs> but I think that the gravity of that is what we're talking about, about danger. And, you know, I relate to that both as a child and thinking of my folks, and then also as a mother and like feeling so bad for my children. <laughs> but this is not to be guilt inducing, but it is really talking about the power of what we're talking about. Well, and it's actually very compassionate inducing. Oh, it really it's is. so compassionate because so many people think, I don't want to go back to my childhood and blame my parents. That's a really common and understandable. And that is really actually not what therapy is about, believe it or not. But it, this is getting to know what got encoded in your body on an unconscious level. And it's actually a way to deeply compassionately know your family history and your cultural history. Oh, I really like that. I was just going to say it actually can make you closer to your parents. Yeah. As you become more accepting and loving of your whole self, all right. of these different dimensions, as you get more integrated, that's what security looks like, is not having to distort any information that you know we want to wrap our arms around. Each of you and all of us and every single one of us deserves this. And then from that compassionate place, we can begin to look up our family chain and our family chain and our cultural chain. And what I really to emphasize to look up the family chain, not just from what physically happened, because some cultures have had a lot of trauma. That doesn't mean that that ends up in pathology. It ends up in how they culturally integrate the information systems in order to keep us out of danger. And that's such a healthy way to look at it. So if you think about all three information systems we're talking about, think about your history, your cultural history, your family history up the line about how one deals with the somatic, the body, how one deals with sort of the thought processes and how they make sense of the information, how they deal with emotions. Think about all three of those when you think about yourself or the people you love. And that really may help you develop a deeper understanding of what may be right present and what may be split off on a really understandable level. Yeah, I think you said that really well. This is where we get into the quieter nuance. Mm -hmm. It's very gentle. This is bottom up work. Again, it goes back to the polyvagal, goes to somatic, goes to EMDR, it goes to anything where you're gaining real affect, that's true affect. So grieving loss, grieving abandonment, that's very, very different than the failure to mourn. I wanted to mention one other listener, I'll give the initials MW, who wrote in and said that this person and their partner, there were patterns of generational abuse. They both say they can't call their parents abusive, but yet they've really passed along unintentionally these damaged coping mechanisms. It's a great way to put it. I really love it. Thank you, MW. And their damaged coping mechanisms, they were adaptive at the time. That's really important to remember. They were actually very protective and functional at a time. It's just in a different context and taken out and continuing to use them when the danger is still present. That's where it becomes maladaptive. That's right. And it's strategic. So right. we talk a lot about the strategic adaptation so another thing to remember about this, even when you look back and you think that your folks were fine, why am I kind of uh, a little funky in my relationship? Over there, a little red. funky or just, you know, that I know that I'm not quite right. Remember that our bodies have been absorbing information about our environment from the get go. And in doing so, it's encoding it. That's why it's called neuroception. We aren't aware that we're taking the information in. So a lot of times when people can't point to anything, but they know something's wrong, besides the generational stuff that we're talking about, it can also just be that it's pre-verbal and we can sense it and we know something about danger. We know something where we have big reactions to things that we don't understand. And we might not ever get that, you know, memory's not like the tape that you pop in. And it's like, oh, this was my repressed memory. This was what the trauma. It often does not look like that at all because it was never encoded in the hippocampus. It was never encoded in that kind of memory. Again, think of it as it's the water that the fish is swimming in. So there's not going to ever be an aha, look at the water. But that doesn't mean that you can't heal and grow. And especially, for example, if we can begin to do things like visualization, ideal parent, we begin to pepper in some of these really bottom-up treatment strategies. 
that way we don't have to have anything to point to. We can just, as we love ourselves and care about ourselves, that we bring our body more online as ugly, as hard as it is, as embarrassing as it might feel to feel things that you're not used to feeling. That's the bottom up that we begin, if we get upset very fast and and we're very reactive and don't understand how people, why people are kind of avoiding us, that we can compassionately like bring ourselves off the ceiling and begin to let other people have an influence on us. It's not that they're running away from us. It might be that we're unintentionally pushing them away with our volume that we're trying to get our attention, which again was strategic and adaptive at one time. And then the same thing, if it's hard to get your heart online, same thing that was adapt, you know, your body and your emotions online, it was adaptive coping strategies at one time, even if there's not anything to point to just trust us on this. It's good news. It's a good message. We're all worthy and we're all valuable of care, no matter what, no matter whose face you're looking into. I want you to see if you can begin to absorb that and hear that directed at you, the person listening right now. You're included in that. And I'm included in that, which is really freaky. And you're included in that, Ann Kelly. Those are some great thoughts. It feels like we can talk for hours and hours because there's so much more to talk about in this. But those are some highlights of Patricia Crittenden. Be sure if you get a chance to, if you haven't already, to go ahead and listen to episodes 96 and 97 because you'll get so much more. So thank you very much, Dr. Crittenden, for your generosity. We hope to continue to be in touch. And also a shout out to the whole huge body of original research that so much of this is based on that started with Bowlby and Ainsworth. There is no disrespect at all in making these comparisons. I mean, I'm on my knees in gratitude. <laughs> like, we would not be where we are without this incredible, rich body of research. Okay, we're going to sign off to protect your time here, and we look forward to seeing you around the bin. We'll see you around the bin. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 